And now, finally, I would like to invite eh, the man who carries the whip. <laughs> I hope you guys are ready for another whipping. <laughs> are you ready? Are you ready for another whipping? I can't hear you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for apples to Mose. <laughs> Pastor Kevin, that's not good. <laughs> pray for me. So that my whip is working well. Yes, we will pray for you. Guys, please stretch your hands. If you can't say a word of prayer, pray for your heart also. That it will be ready to take what is being taught. We know it's not that it's not what God has told him that will work, it's what our hearts hear. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, let's pray. Almighty Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your servant. Oh, Lord, as, he's, as he shares, Lord, may you speak through him, Lord. May you speak to every heart that is under the sound of my voice. Lord, may you speak to our minds, may you speak to our hearts, O oh God. Oh, Lord, may your spirit convict us, convict us greatly to follow what you're teaching us, Lord. We know, Lord, you're taking us to greater heights, and that's why you've brought your servant here and given him specific word for us, O oh God. So, Lord, we submit to listen to your servant. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Wow. Thank you, Pastor Kevin. Uh, well, I, I feel like I've been distributing sweets. And then people are claiming that I've been distributing uh, Ugali and Skumawiki. Good morning. So glad to be here again. This is day four. Yeah. And like yesterday, they are going to put on my monitor so that I don't shout at the saints. Hey. Thank you again, Pastor M and Pastor Carol, for having us uh, and the whole team feeding us. What? Overfeeding us, housing us, everything, every good thing. Can I just ask the gentleman to come up because I didn't have an opportunity to introduce the gentleman that I moved with. Yay. <laughs> or what they should introduce themselves. Pastor Samuel is my usual assistant microphone. You've been chosen to start. Don't tell us your age. Good morning. This mic is in the monitor. Go ahead. My name is Jeremy Biamanzi from Worship Harvest downtown. Woohoo! Very glad to be here. Thank you. Tell us a little bit more. Don't be as if you work for the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy Biamanzi, I uh, minister with Worship Harvest Ministries. I am involved with the media team. I lead the media team. I'm also involved as a cluster leader. So together with my wife, we lead a group of churches, uh, five churches. There'll be seven churches by the end of August. Oh, no. hey. And also Worship Harvest Downtown. Thank you. Wow. And business? Business. I'm involved in media and advertising. That's my forte, really. So very glad to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Good morning, everybody. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Senor Jost. It, it, was, it was intentional to not ask them to stand with their spouses so that we don't have any kind of comparisons going on. Go ahead, Stephen. You don't say. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Senor Jost Stephen, and together with my wife, Florence, we lead Worship Harvest Nakawa, and on top of that, we lead a network of a cluster of churches. Worship, uh, there's about four churches right now. 
uh, growing to five ch churches by the end of this year. And on top of that, I am a commercial photographer and, t and the team leader at Secheru Media, where we help organizations take better photos for their online marketing. Hey, come on. Okay, shake it Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Emmanuel Okulo. I go by another name, Milton, so my namesake is around here somewhere. Hey. He's over there. Um, uh, with my wife, Angela, we lead a cluster which consists of five different churches, including Worship Harvest Nairobi. <laughs> we, are, we are also the location pastors for Worship Harvest Bugolobi. I am a practicing obstetrician, gynecologist, and an embryologist. Um, and what else do I do? I am also a straightforward financial growth coach with uh, the material from Apostle Mose. Uh, yeah, that's about what I do. We've got two children. Uh, first is seven. The other is six and three. Yeah. I've got a six-year-old and a three-year-old. They are turning seven this month. So I stood up to represent them because this month is their birth month. Thank you very much. Hey. Thank you so much, uh, gentlemen. Uh, F Pastor Florence was uh, starting to object concerning the children part. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you guys, we are genuinely happy, by the way. It's not like we come to put on a show because you can't sustain it. If you just try to be happy at Hill City and then unhappy, at, uh, at, at uh, Valley Village, it doesn't work. <laughs> Thank you so much again, Pastor M and Pastor Carol again for having us. And Pastor Mills, wow, that was, that was, that was God. That was God. You were hearing God. So thank you so much. We appreciate God for using you mightily this morning. Amen. You're going to see more and more of that here at Mavuno. Yeah. Jesus went about teaching, preaching, and healing. Yeah. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. The moment you start messing with this thing called anointing, you're just going to start healing. Yeah, it's just, it's, that's it. Uh, someone said that if you take the miracles out of the Gospels and the book of Acts, you wouldn't have much left. You wouldn't have much left. So, we, I believe in the power of God, miracles, and all of that stuff. So any day, I mean any day, give me miracles rather than non-miracles. Any day. Amen. So yesterday we started on the, uh, on the practicals of becoming a movement. And there are five things we are looking at. What are they? <laughs> to ask your neighbor to, to shout it to you. To shout you the ac acronym. PEVTH. PEVTH. P-E-V-T-H. P-E-V-T-H. P-E-V. T-H. And P stands for? Yeah. Are there any believers in the house? Yeah. Come on. I want to say it like Pastor Kevin. Come on! <laughs> well, Pastor Kevin, just record for me that come on of yours and I take it and they apply it so that every time I'm preaching, I just tell the guys at the sound desk, just Every time I make a point, play that thing. <laughs> so we looked at prayer and people are repenting. In my group, we call it repenting. Because it's just about the same thing. <laughs> because you can't repent without repenting. If you think has been gray and you want it to be green, you have to first change your mind and say, I want green. And you can't have both. So that's what repenting is. It's similar to repenting. So you can tell your neighbor, neighbor, it's time to repent. 
So prayer, 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 prayer is what we looked at. And we looked at so many different things. And I kept remembering things after we had gone into a group that I should have shared. So I was sending texts around. Share in the group. Zoom, 5 a.m., what? Hey. Yeah, so prayer. Prayer is critical. When we visited Redemption Camp, courtesy of Pastor M, Pastor M took me to Nigeria. I tell you. Yeah. If you become a good follower, you will also be taken. Are you aware? Machakos. So we visited Redemption Camp. This is the, the headquarters of Redeemed Christian Church of God. One of the biggest uh, movements in the world. Led by uh, Pastor Adeboye. Okay, Daddy Gio. Man, you should go to Redemption Camp. Make it your life's ambition. Forget all these other things you've been to. No. You must go to Redemption Camp in person. Because there is simply no video, picture, image, description that will get you to understand. Because even when you try to take the pictures, it's useless. It's like you can't fit the thing in the frame of a picture. I took a video driving up along the auditorium on my phone for one hour, what not one hour, one minute and about 50 seconds. Driving. And we were, and I started in the middle. Imagine you're driving across this auditorium and you drive for one minute and 50 seconds taking a video and you haven't finished it. In a car, like in a van. I say, who gave these people permission? Which committee allowed this kind of thinking? The audacity of it. So when we finished, they told us, now that's the old one. That one is being used as an overflow during their monthly Holy Ghost meetings. It's the overflow. They said, let's take you to the new one. Which is still under construction. Because it's supposed to be three kilometers by three kilometers. I'm like, why? Why? Because when they have their, their prayer meetings, their Holy Ghost meetings, once a month, more than a million people come. So anyway, this guy was telling us about Daddy G.O., when we're driving around Redemption Camp, it's like a, it's a town of its own, it's a municipality. And it's a, they say that he actually walks around praying around Redemption Camp every night, somewhere between 9 or 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. And indeed, some of the people who are on, on our traveling party confirmed that they had ever run into him. Now, of course, everyone who goes there tries to look for him to run into him, but they don't find them. They don't find him. When you're leading a movement with more than 40,000 churches, I think there is no strategy, no management system, nothing works. The only thing you're left with is what? Prayer. Yeah, that's it. So that's prayer. Now, today I want us to talk about evangelism. And visitation, the EV in the PEV, evangelism and visitation, Acts 2. We are looking at Acts 2, 40 to 47. That's the focus scripture for the PEV. Uh, let's read together loudly. And with many other words together, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word, I still don't hear you, were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. 
And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in what? Prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church, the Lord added to the church, the Lord added to the church, those who are being saved. Ask your neighbor, does your campus grow daily? Tell your neighbor, your campus can grow daily. Okay, at least weekly. Amen. So we see right from the get-go that when the Holy Spirit came down, the church started growing. But how did it grow? Remember, there were no people to, go to, to attract from other churches. It wasn't like the Holy Spirit has come. Now those in the church at Antioch are going to join those in Jerusalem. Uh, those in Emmaus are now moving because the church in Jerusalem has better sound system. So now those from Emmaus are moving. Ah, the guys in Jericho, ah, they don't serve hot tea at the end of services. So everyone is moving to Jerusalem. Where are the people? <laughs> <laughs> when the Holy Spirit came down, what was the first activity of the church? Was it a singles meeting? Was it a marriage meeting? Was it a committee meeting? Was it an elders meeting? Was it a... Was it... <laughs> Did someone just say bad things about Mizizi around there? <laughs> yeah, was it a Mizizi class? Sort of a Mizizi class, just had too many people. And it was short. <laughs> it was a short Mizizi class. And 3,000, the first activity when the Holy Spirit came was what? Evangelism. Evangelism is the first order of business for any church that claims to have received the Holy Spirit. Evangelism cannot be the last order of business. Evangelism cannot be one of the programs to do when we have now properly organized ourselves and have a venue. Amen, amen, amen. It's order one. And by the way, let me go a little bit into business right now. That's what differentiates serious businesses from non-serious businesses. Serious businesses understand that the first order of business is marketing. Yeah, if you're going to go anywhere as a CEO. In fact, I keep teaching people, let's say, what, what do they sell in markets here? That is commonly sold in a market, a roadside market. Arrowroot? Tomatoes. Okay, let me go with tomatoes. If, if, if you have an auntie who runs a roadside kiosk and sells tomatoes, you see that? And then you have another auntie who grows tomatoes somewhere in the village. Yeah? Which of the two has a business? Okay, which one of the two will easily come to mind that, ah, this one is, has a business? Who would you say has a, is in the marketplace? You see, a product is not business. I'm now teaching business people. 
Having a product doesn't make you a business. The business is not a product. The business is the market. You see that person who sells tomatoes? They may even come in the morning with zero stock. And they will go home with money. Because the product is not a business. That's the biggest mistake. That's why people are broke constantly and they wonder what's wrong. Because they think that I have my product. Oh, I'm good at this. I'm good at... Who cares? You can continue being good. It's the market that makes your business, not the product. My friend here, Pastor B3, runs a, a baking a, a, a company that like bakes some of the best pastries in Kampala. It's called Home Baked. Yeah, seriously, by like seriously, she even when she's here this whole week, she's making money daily, daily. And what sets her product apart from a lot of people is the marketing. It's the branding. I mean, she's married to a brand guy. Some stuff, just like there's bedroom advantages where you are, uh, in some other places there's none. It is the pro. It's the what? The market. It's the market. So if, if let's say she's producing 10 packages, packs of scones a day, and she has what? 10, ten what? 10 customers. Make sense? Are you understanding? If you are producing 10 packages of scones, you should have 10 clients. That, that's the, how the equation works. M market saturation should be matched by production. Let's say she came to one of my seminars and I talked about going big, you're losing your life, how can you just be there doing small, small things? What's your problem? You think that the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death? And then she's like, I have had it. I'm going big. And the next day she produces 100 packs of scones. What do you think is going to happen? Talk to me, people. Look, first of all, it's too cold for you to be dozing. Like, it's impossible. Don't even try. So talk to me. Yeah? What's going to happen? You're going to have, the kids are going to eat all the scones they can eat. The neighbor's kids are going to eat scones. The whole neighborhood will be eating scones for free. Why? What's her problem? She expanded the production line before she expanded the market, which shows you where the business is. The business is not in the production line. The business is in the market. In fact, the wisest thing to do, first expand the market, advertise, create hunger, and people are like, we are looking for your scones. And they're like, okay, tomorrow. It only makes sense to expand the market first before you expand production. Because it's even more expensive to expand production before expanding market. You can expand market just using social media. To expand production, you have to buy another oven. You have to hire more people. You have, it's just messy. You probably have to move to another location. But people never understand that. That's why some people who are in Fearless Institute still have their books they wrote last year at their homes catching dust. <laughs> Oh, ah, you got to tell people I'm an author. Where, where are your books? You're an author. Yeah, thanks. You're not a business person. Yeah, you just happen to write because the school required you to write to graduate. Now, it's that same lack of understanding that has turned into small, small businesses all over the place in the whole country because they don't market, that has also led to small, small churches all over the place because they don't do evangelism. You see, the moment you start a church and you're a good shepherd, are there good shepherds here? Are there good shepherds? 
are there people with a pastoral calling? First, forget us apostles. We, are, we can be problematic sometimes. But shepherds, good shepherds, your heart is for the people. My heart is for the people. Do you know what's going to revolutionize your life as a shepherd? Don't look at your congregation as the sheep. Look at the whole neighborhood as the sheep. And ask yourself, where are my sheep? Look at, what is this place? Great Wall of China Gardens. What is it called? Great Wall Gardens. I, w I looked for the gardens. In Great Wall Gardens, all I saw were the Great Walls. But the gardens, you have to discern them, Pastor Joro. <laughs> but they are there. So like Pastor Joro and Pastor J. Mo, that is your congregation. That is your congregation. They said, you, you have to think how many churches are in our region and how many people are there. You see, the day you look at things like that, you see, most people, they sell their little, little things from their businesses and they've never stopped to think, who else could be buying this? Because once you do the market evaluation and look at the real prospects who could be your purchasers, you, you will see that you instantly are going to become a millionaire. But it's because the devil has managed to blind us and, and we have become those not so good shepherds who do not seek the lost. We are more concerned about the found. Are you with me? Give me Ezekiel. Give me Ezekiel 34, 2 to 4. Ezekiel 34, 2 to 4. I believe I'm talking to, the, to, the, to, to anointed people, movers and shakers. Are you with me? Let's read. Don't, don't fear. Let's read. Uh huh. Son of man. Uh huh. What does he say? Prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them. Now, do you think he's talking about people who keep sheep? No, he's talking about. He's not talking about sheep keepers. He's talking about pastors. Prophesy and say to them. Uh huh. Together, that says the God, the Lord God, to the shepherds. Whoa. To the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? We will deal with this later. Verse 3. You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. I'm saying we are going to talk about this later. The main point is not here. Verse 6, 4. The weak you have not strengthened. Nor have you healed those who were sick. Pastor Milton was being a good shepherd right here in the morning. Uh-huh. Let's continue. Let's continue. No bound up the broken, no brought back what was driven away. Hey, 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 read that one slowly. Next, uh-huh. No sought what was lost. But with force and cruelty you have ruled them. When you're not seeking the lost, you're not a good shepherd. Especially if you say, me, of the fivefold ministry, me, I feel I'm not an evangelist. Me, I'm not an evangelist. I'm a teacher. Hey, who is going to teach the ones who are there who don't know their left hand from their right hand? Who are beating their wives and smoking stuff to try and become the most high? Hey, hallelujah. I'm talking to the shepherds. Because you may have said, me, I'm not apostolic. This thing of planting churches, I'm not apostolic. That's for Pastor M, he's apostolic. Look, we are all apostolic. You see, Jesus had, to, he had many disciples, first of all, of whom he invited 12, whom he named what? Apostles, all the 12. He didn't say, um, there's going to be this guy Paul is going to talk about fivefold. So, after 12, let's have 
First of all, one apostle. More than one apostle is even already too bad. Too bad. Yeah. Like you can't get apostles marrying each other. There will be burnt houses all over the place. So, let's have one apostle. Uh, two prophets. At least they can always check with each other who is accurate, who is not. Maybe three evangelists. Uh -uh. Those are too many. Two evangelists. Five pastors. And then two teachers. Do you see that's how the church thinks? Personality. Now, you see, these guys, they started calling me apostles. Apostle, after we went through that lesson of, oops, we are calling this guy pastor. There is very little pastor in him. We are, yeah. Have you ever tried to call uh, something, uh, something else? Like you're trying to call a lion a leopard. Oh, leopard, leopard. Oh, oh giraffe. Giraffe. Yeah. You might end up believing it and behave like a what? A giraffe. You see, the reason the church is not making the kind of advancement it should be making is because we have tamed all the apostles. We have called them pastors. Okay, let's say we are all pastors. I'm talking about shepherds. A good shepherd is one who thinks about the people, those ends, where there is no church yet. And says, I will go for that one. That's good shepherding. So a good shepherd must automatically be very passionate about evangelism, even when they don't have an evangelistic gift like me. Of the fivefold, that's my worst. Yeah, they can tell you. Like, if you want to punish me thoroughly, put me in a crowd and say, now you're going to preach the gospel to strangers or something. Like, that guy is not saved. Go talk to him. I'll be like, bathroom first. I can't do this. <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm just telling you the truth. I was telling you about apostles. So he calls all 12 and says, now you are all what? Apostles. All 12? Yes, what are you doing? Divide up. No, you're all apostles. Okay, they did do a personality test. There's this Peter who just, he has foot in mouth disease. He talks, then he starts thinking, what did I just say? Then there was Simon the Zealot. Like, we're going to fight. We're going to fight. Fight for our rights. Then there's John, who's just there, putting his head on Jesus' chest. Like, man, that stuff, if it had come out nowadays, people would be like, what's going on here? I already said, all of them are what? Apostles, regardless of personality type. Why the market demands it? Yeah. The market demands it. See, most people are broke because they only do things they are passionate about. The people who are rich, they are rich because they do the things they are passionate about and the things they are not passionate about. As long as they bring money. They, they will start it and employ someone who is passionate about it, do it for them, and then they get the profit. They get it. How did we even reach here? I'm supposed to be teaching about evangelism. Good Shepherd. Six. That which was us. Uh, I started by talking about this whole claim to being filled by the Holy Spirit. And it, what did Jesus say? <laughs> Even Isaiah. Jesus was quoting Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is because he has anointed me. What is the first thing? Preach the gospel. It's not to heal the sick even. Even though that's also there. We are going to deal with that tomorrow maybe. But the first thing is to preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. That's what shows you have been anointed. 
the anointing, the Holy Spirit is not for shaking, the Holy Spirit is not for falling, the Holy Spirit is not for your right toe to start feeling itchy and not for your right knee to start shaking and whatever it is. All that, all that stuff is good. Yeah. I mean, in our church, people shake. And people used not to fall in our church, by the way. They were the church where you don't fall. But nowadays, they also fall. They shake, they fall, they vibrate, they scream, they laugh, they feel good. But that is secondary. Mm. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to what? Preach. Preach the gospel. Evangelism. What did, it, what did Jesus tell them in um, Acts 1.8? You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall vibrate and you shall shake and you shall fall hey, and you shall feel heat hey, and you shall roll and laugh what will happen when you receive the Holy Spirit and powers come upon you what's the first thing what? what's going to happen you uh, no, no. And you who are extroverts. Like Pastor Joro. <laughs> shall be witnesses. The introverts, you work in the sound room. No, sound room guys, I love you. I mean, we couldn't work with, without you guys. And we are not even introverts anyway. Please don't mute my mic. I beg. I beg. I beg. The extroverts shall be witnesses. The introverts shall be in the prayer room praying for the extrovert. Do you know one of the worst things that can ever happen to any church? Oh, this is sensitive. One of the worst things that can ever happen to any church is to have a ministry called intercession. I don't allow intercession ministry at worship service. No, 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 no. Because when people think that for them, they are the ones called to pray, they are the ones who hear from God, they even start disturbing the pastors. Pastor, this is what the Lord is saying. Our pastor, you said this the other day, we don't feel we met and prayed and we don't think that's what the Lord is saying. I don't know whether those things have ever happened at Mavuna. I don't even know whether there's an intercession team. I'm just saying at our church, they are not there. Yeah. Yeah, there is a prophetic intercessory team. For them, they hear from God. And they come and tell everyone how the lead pastor is wrong and going off course. Ha, huh. wow. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, and the Lord spoke to Moses again, saying, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, you're like, Lord, why don't you talk to Miriam also and Aaron? Why is he only talking to Moses? There's Joshua. Look, when God wants to instruct this church, this church here, he knows the address of the leaders. Let me make it even plainer. God, can you imagine the first person that had a vision of the future of the world was Nebuchadnezzar, a non-believer. Like the only person God could talk to about that thing, the only person who, had, who was at the level of authority to receive that revelation was a non-believer, Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel, the prophet, he only became relevant when he could interpret the dream. When he could dream the same, th when he could see the same thing Nebuchadnezzar had seen in the night. Not his own vision. Then he couldn't come and say, okay, Nebuchadnezzar, I know we ha you had a dream, you want to kill everyone because they refused to tell you, but let me tell you what the Lord is saying. No. They went and prayed and said, God, the guy is killing our friends, the, the, our fellow sorcerers. Help us! Help, show us what he's saying. And God showed Daniel 
in the night, in the vision of the night. In other words, what Nebuchadnezzar had dreamt is what Daniel dreamt. And because Daniel dreamt what Nebuchadnezzar dreamt, Daniel was promoted. Your promotion is in having the same dream as your leader. Okay, there was going to be seven years of what? Plenty and seven years of scarcity. Who did God tell? Who did God tell? Was Pharaoh seeking God? Was Pharaoh praying and fasting? You see, heaven is so orderly, it's going to be so bad for a lot of Christians. Yeah, if God wants to talk to a certain campus in this church, he's going to talk to the campus pastor, whether they are fasting or not. Yeah. You will find a way. He might even send them a prophetic voice. They trust usually prophetic voices, but they are there to confirm what God has already been talking to you about. They don't bring new things in the new dispensation of new covenant. We have gone so far from evangelism, but we will come back. God talked to Pharaoh about the coming what? Famine. And on, the only guy who could prove useful to Egypt was the only guy who could interpret Pharaoh's dream and bring a word of wisdom as to what Pharaoh should do. Keep 20% of the grain to sustain. That's why you should be saving at least 20% of your income for your latter years. If you don't do that, you're not wise. The Bible has a word for you. I'll not use it. No, no, no. I'm distributing sweets. Are you with me, friends? We are all shepherds. We are all shepherds. And a good shepherd seeks the lost. The lost. We are all shepherds. We are all operating under an apostolic movement called Mavuno. So we all have apostolic what? Unction. Yeah. We are all goers. Okay, if at least you don't believe it about Mavuno under Jesus, who said, go. Yeah, that's apostleship. Romans 1, 5 says, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Amen, amen, amen. Let me, oops. This is gl glorious. Why do you doubt it? <laughs> One doubted him. I'm joking. So evangelism, evangelism, evangelism. Look, guys, growing a church is not a mystery anymore. <laughs> is it? No, it's not. You go talk to the sinners and bring them in. That's all. It's not a mystery. I, I kid you not, it's not a mystery. I've discovered it's not a mystery. The other day we did some sort of uh, apostolic, evangelistic, shepherdorio analysis. And we figured out that Greater Kampala, Kampala and the surrounding, you know, there is what they call Kampala Metropolitan, which is Kampala and all the neighboring sort of towns that have fused now into Kampala has about 7 million people. Greater Kampala. I don't know Greater Nairobi, how many people are in Greater Nairobi? Probably a lot more. Has about 7 million people. Amen. Now, let's go, let's imagine that we are going with Jesus' uh, analysis of the parable of the sower, that only a quarter of the people will actually receive your word. Only a quarter. In other words, there are people, even if you like how, they will never 
listen to you. They are, they are not your people of peace. Even Jesus had the rich young ruler. He said, no. Uh, I, I like the money. So there are people who are your people of peace and people who are not your people of peace. So your people of peace are those who hear the word and do it. So let's go with 25%. So that will be 7 million divided by 4. That's 1.75 million. Greater Kampala alone. Let's say the word we preach as worship harvest, let's say it appeals to only 25% of the people. That would be 1.75 million. <laughs> so, if we were to have only mega churches, like 2,000 and above, no church below 2K, divide by 2,000. That's 875 mega churches of worship harvest in Greater Kampala alone to reach 25%. Now you're going to be there and say, ah, but the other churches were so... You, do you know their vision? Do you know that they, are, they want to reach people? Do you know whether they started for economic purposes? Yeah. You see, you can't go to war making assumptions that someone else will fight for you. So don't make those assumptions. Everyone has their own vision. You, God has spoken to you about being a movement that changes the world. So Greater Nairobi alone will probably need about a thousand Mavuno mega churches. Before you go to those ends, the, the other side, what? No, just Nairobi. So for us, we know we need 875 in Kampala alone. This is research data. There is Greater Kampala and there is Kampala District. The concentrate Njora has been there, so he knows these places. The, the, four, the five divisions of Kampala. The five divisions of Kampala, the population density is 8,000 people per square kilometer. And outside concentrated Kampala, Greater Kampala is 2,000 people per square kilometer. In other words, if you were to have enough, even if you were to have just the 25%, you would still need a mega church for every square kilometer in Kampala. And every, a mega church for every four square kilometers, that's two kilometers by two, in Greater Kampala. So in Kampala, it would be one kilometer by one. Greater Kampala, two kilometers by two, to take 25%. Mega, not these things of, uh, I have 500 people. If you have 500 people, then you need four of them. It's not a mystery, is it? Yeah. So when you show up with your church of 2,000 in a city of 7 million, you stop, don't make noise. There's nothing going on there. I mean, you can't change what you don't hate. Yeah. You have to get to grips with the reality that the Bible is true. Sinners are sinners. Saints are saints. People who don't know Jesus have an eternal uh, destiny away from God. And there is a window to change it. And you start changing it. And you can't do it without evangelism. Amen, brothers and sisters. Matthew 18, 11 says, The Son of Man came to save that which was lost. Matthew 16, 15 to 16 says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. But you be watchful in all things and your afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. It's not good news if it gets there late. The gospel is good news, not good advice. And it's not good news if it gets there late. You see what's preoccupying you and I is good advice about just about everything. 
how to turn down your collar, how to shorten your trouser. How, like, like, let's go and first deal with the good news concept part of it. So when we realized how serious this thing was, and having started, of course, listening to Bishop Doug, wise, wise man, we found out something in his book, The Mega Church. If, if you get it, please read it. Uh, there, his books are not available in bookshops. You have to find the Lighthouse Chap Ch Church, Lighthouse Chapel Church in your neighborhood to get the books because they have them. So there's, this book, The Mega Church, is where... I, you guys, I wish I could tell you. Anyway, no, I don't have to wish to tell you. I'm going to tell you. I was reading the mega church towards the end. Eh? In one of the chapters, he talked about the secret of industrialization. <laughs> that was the unlocking. You know, you don't know what you don't know. Mm. You don't know? What you don't know. And the only thing worse than not knowing what you don't know is not knowing that you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So I'm reading this book, The Mega Church, and I reach the secret of industrialization, and I'm like, oh my goodness, why have I been on my life? Of course, you're looking at me like, what was in his tea this morning? Let me just tell you. So up to that point, up for in 20... Was it 2019? 2018 and 2019. We, we finally repented from our lack of seriousness about evangelism. And do you know where it came from? Yeah. Very weak at evangelism. I'm strong at anything else than evangelism. So the church I did was naturally what? Terrible at evangelism. We didn't even used to make for, for like altar calls in service. Like, altar call! <laughs> Once in a while. So we decided to craft something called the one campaign. Where everyone was going to go and identify a person. One person. Week one, you pray and fast for them. Week two, you, you take them out, have a meal with them. Week three, you, yeah, you serve them, ask them something you can do for them. Wasn't that week two? Yeah, week one, pray for them with fasting. Week two, you no, know, serve them, ask them, is there where I can serve you? Buy them groceries, something, anything. Week three, take them out for a meal and share the gospel. Week four, bring them to church because we are going to have the final Sunday. It's the evangelism Sunday and what we, we all did. We are very clever. We all figured out we lack this anointing. So each one of us, we looked for our ministry friends who are like, this one is a hot evangelist. Oh, whoever is doing crusades, that's our preacher for that Sunday. So we brought them. And man, we started seeing more salvations. Now before that, we would have like, uh, I remember it was very embarrassing. You would have like 100 salvations a year across the whole church. Then when we did that, Things jumped up to about 300 salvations that year, 2018, through the one campaign. About 350. 2019, it was even more exciting. Or like some people here would say, exciting. We, 521, I remember the numbers. 521 people got saved. I was so excited because I even remember I participated in that one campaign. I even remember the guy I preached to and I remember that I nursed him, nursed him, nursed him, brought him to church on that last stand of evangelism. He walked forward. I! <laughs> Amen. So 521. So, lockdown cometh. 2020, our one campaign didn't take off. Because the time it was supposed to happen is when lockdown happened. So we make adjustments, go on media. Uh, then I, uh, the, you, to, do you remember the long story? I eventually start 
listening to Bishop Doug and reading his books. So in uh, September, I re I'm reading the mega church. Then I find the secret. No, it was October of industrialization. October 2020. And in, in that book, he's like, don't try to do evangelism centrally. It doesn't work. The evangelism in the church only works when it is the members doing evangelism. Through the system that you have set up. So, thankfully, we had missional communities. We had re reorganized them through lockdown. People moving into missional communities that were near where they stayed. Because previously, you would have some, a missional community with someone from Mombasa Road, someone from Kangemi, someone from Vika Road, someone from Wayakiwe. And someone, they are all in one missional community. So the meetings were complicated because we were not even meeting online. So people would miss MC meetings just because of the logistical work. So when COVID came, lockdown, we have to take care of people. We we're like, it was a good time to move things around. You are now belonging to a missional community near where you stay because you need to be able to share your food, uh, walk to each other's homes because they were not allowing us to drive. So, so now, now things have aligned. Huh? Missional communities are in the neighborhood. And then I read Secret of Industrialization. Immediately, I called the team meeting. I said, from next week, hmm, we have adopted a new strategy. Every missional community is going to lead one person to Christ per week. Yeah, is that too much to ask? What, guys? Hey, you are 20 of you, really? Just one person a week? People agreed. That October, we had 500 salvations. In one month. November, we had 1,000 salvations. We had two times the number of salvations we were having in a year. Just by moving the work of evangelism from the pulpit to the mission or community. And now here is how it works really nicely with the mission committee. Because you are evangelizing people in the neighborhood, when they get saved, what do they join? The mission or community. Because if Pastor Njoro preaches a hot sermon here and someone gets saved and they are from Kangemi, what are you going to do about that? They will just go back to Kangemi and you hope they don't backslide. But if a mission or community in block H in a, in a Great Wall Wall leads <laughs> leads a person to Christ there. Guess which mission committee they are going to join? That, that that one there. So now they start walking the journey. Now from that time we have a rest month every June and December. So we took a rest month in December and then January we started, 2021. When I checked in end of June, by end of June, from when this whole thing blew up in October, by end of June, we had had more than 12,000 salvations. 12,000. Right now, we are having more than 800 salvations weekly. A week. And we have multiplied from about 150 missional communities then, in October, to 710 now. Why? Because the mission communities are growing so fast and multiplying because of evangelism. It's not magical. Imagine with me that you have a mission community of 10 people and they start leading one person to Christ a week. After a month, how many will they be? 14. After two months, 18. After, and by the way, they don't do one. As I've shared with you, you're seeing that they are leading a lot more people to Christ than one. But let's say they stuck with just that. Because that's supposed to be like the worst ones. After three months, there'll be 22. After six months, that mission of community, after three months, that mission of community will be ready to double. And if they keep going, after six months, that one mission of community will have become eight mission of communities in only six months. And in a year, it will be 32 mission of communities. Just one group 
leading one. Imagine all the life groups in Mavuno start leading one person to Christ a week. You will not believe the multiplication. Here's the other beautiful thing. When they tell you you are the one going to preach to the people in uh, that block, do you think anyone needs to tell you to pray? <laughs> that you just have a full breakfast, what? You quarrel with your wife, then say, okay, let's go for evangelism. Do you think that's going to happen? No, 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 no. Holiness shall attack your life like a problem. <laughs> you, it will just hit you. It's not by power. It's not by Wogali. It's not by Sukuma. It's by the Spirit. Evangelism at the smallest unit of the church works. The higher up you delegate evangelism, the worse, the worse it is. Visitation. Visitation. So, visitation, we look at it in terms of follow-up. So, Acts again to 46 to 47. What does it say? 46. I'm sure right now everyone is running the numbers for their campus. <laughs> you see, that's why I was telling you what has happened. A year ago, we were 4,000. Now, we are 13,000. How did that happen? Evangelism. Evangelism and retention. So that's the other thing. The visitation kicks in there. So continuing daily with an accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with other people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. I can tell you, uh, I'm so glad I'm the luckiest man in the world because I lead a church called Worship Harvest to which the Lord is adding how often? Daily. Yeah. Our garage attendance, that's our services, goes up by about a thousand a week now. Because when evangelism is at that level, the growth is exponential. It's not linear. Because if you have 10 people ministering to 10 people, if you have 10 mission committees leading one person to Christ, you get 10 salvations. If you have 100 mission communities leading one person to Christ, you get 100 salvations, not 10. So the curve is exponential. Our vision is to have, a, 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 at present, they've been rebuked because I've been told it's too small, but I still have to figure out how to define it. Currently, our vision is a million people in a thousand churches, each with a thousand people, being discipled in 50,000 missional communities, leading 50,000 people to Christ weekly. That means if we get to accomplish our vision, we'll be leading 50,000 people to Christ every week. 50,000 people is 25 mega churches per week. That will be our launch rate. In July, before they announced the lockdown, we were supposed to launch 12 churches on one Sunday because of what I'm telling you. We had to postpone. We, we launched two. We launched another two the other Sunday. I think as soon as we go back home, we should launch another two and then maybe another two like that. By December, we'll have launched minimum 12. Why? Because of the exponential nature of what I'm telling you. And when it's at, the, I think Pastor M called them, the new ones are going to be called discipleship communities. When it's at discipleship community level, the people who are saved are retained. As opposed to these things, you go to a big mass rally, People get saved, then they disappear. We used to do that stuff in, in high school, in, not in university. We wouldn't trace that people got saved. But here, there's retention. Again, I found that in that same book, The Mega Church by Bishop Doug. He talked about research that was done about some guy did research, I think it was a vet or someone, about a chicken house. And the fact that 
there was a farmer who was struggling so hard to increase the number of chickens in, at the chicken farm. And until they introduced a certain, um, I don't remember what it was. It was some sort of drug or medicine or something. And then the numbers of the, on the chicken farm went up exponentially. Why? Because the chickens were not dying. Now, do you know what has happened in the last 200 years? Stick with me. Until about 1800, 1800, they were at around 1800, there were only about 1 billion people on earth. 1 billion. With 1. 1 billion. Like there were that few people on the planet. You could get land here for free. In 1800. In the last 200 years, we have added more than 6 billion people. Do you know why? Vaccines. Vaccines and advancement in medicine. If you read all the biographies of the people those days, you can see even all the guys, all the, they, they, they would have, like Maria Woodworth, Etta had how many? Six children, she lost five. People would have many kids because they knew they were, some were going to die. Nowadays, infant mortality is so low because of advancement in medicine and vaccinations that you cannot, it's, it's, it's the anomaly to lose a child. That time, it was an anomaly to raise a child. You expected to lose children. So to hedge yourself against losing children, you had many of them. So the birth rate has even actually, what? Reduced. But because of the exponential nature of population increase and modern medicine, our population is just shooting up like that. And the sad thing is that there is not, the population surge has not been matched by church planting surge. That's why there is increase in evil on the earth. You see, if you have a kilogram of salt that is supposed to preserve 100, kilo, 100 what? kilos of meat, and then you increase the meat to 700 kilograms, but you increase the salt by only twice, what do you think is going to happen to the meat? It's going to rot. So you find that in Nairobi and its surrounding areas, this, forget even all this nonsense and media uh, nonsense that there are too many churches. There are not too many churches. Ah, I think I've used some hard language. There are not too many churches. The population increase is not being matched by the necessary church planting. That's why there is evil. That's why there's increase in evil. Are you following? So, so what they found out is that if you prevent death, there is an exponential what? Increase. Now, do you know what we do with our current modern evangelism methods? The death rate of new believers dying to their faith, backsliding, is so high. That's why you can have a church of a thousand people and throughout the year you have two thousand first time guests. But you only increase by a hundred people. If two thousand people checked you out, what happened to them? They were not retained. So wisdom is evangelizing through discipleship communities. Evangelize, retain. Evangelize, retain. Evangelize, retain. Evangelizing and not following up people and keeping them in the family is like going to the hospital to have a child and come back home. You leave them there and get happy with your husband again and then go back to the hospital to have more children and come back home and then go to have more children and come back home. That's what we've been doing as a church. We have so many infants, newly born again, who are not attached to any community or any church because we just went on the rampage. Of he said this prayer after me. Huh? Hey, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I come, in, I, I come to you, I come to you. Forgive my sins, forgive my sins. Hey, from today, from today, you are now saved. I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. Hey, hallelujah. Mm. 
Next. Ah. And then you move on. It's like you've just had a baby. Have you understood? Church growth is not a mystery. It is not. Because all those people in your church have key relationships of people that should be hearing the gospel from them because they trust them and they don't trust you who is on the mic. That, friends, is how we win. Amen. I think I'm Thank you.